So today's ad slot isn't sponsored. Instead, I want to tell you about a charity I work with who could really do with some extra help right now. I'd like you to contemplate for a moment about how you feel when you're really hungry, or if you have a child, how they behave when they're hungry. Terrible, right? Hunger affects everything. Behavior, mood, concentration, ability to learn. A hungry person, and especially a hungry child, isn't anywhere near their best self. Magic Breakfast provides free, nutritious breakfasts to over 1,000 primary, secondary, and ASL special educational needs schools across the UK. Every school day, they offer breakfasts to up to 200,000 children. But it's also not just about the food. I have visited their schools and their clubs also serve as a place for children to come together, get support from teachers, catch up on homework, relax with friends, even get their hair braided. How needed is this charity? Sadly, very, and more so than ever. According to government statistics, before COVID, around 1.7 million children in the UK were living with food insecurity, meaning that they're at risk of hunger in the morning. That number is now looking closer to 4 million. And of course, with the cost of living crisis, it's just rising. I volunteer with Magic Breakfast. I'm on their development board, and I know the money goes where it's needed to supporting children, as well as lobbying for policy change to encourage the government to step in. Magic Breakfast actually always say that their ultimate aim is to make themselves obsolete, to end child hunger for good. If you have the ability to support a hungry child, please do check them out. It's magicbreakfast.com. Thank you. Yeah, totally. And I think society always says this as silly, like, you know, I'm sure you've heard it and you've been there where we always diminish some things that are creative because it sounds like a little silly hobby that we're doing on the side or even something maybe a bit vain. So I think it's just re-giving the nobility to that creativity that it deserves. Um, Because I've always heard that, you always hear it when you're younger that it's supposed to be superficial, but actually it's realising that it's not superficial if you are somewhat creative. It's actually something that fuels you um, and to give it the space that it deserves. Welcome to Priorities, the podcast about the things in life that really matter. I'm your host, journalist and coach Lily Silverton, and each week, along with a roster of incredible guests, I'll be exploring how priorities inform and transform our lives, sharing mindset tips, strategies, tools, and inspiration to help you prioritize your own life. We'll be covering what we think is important and unimportant, what we'd like to work on a little more, and the moments that changed our priorities and lives forever. I hope you enjoy. My guest today is Maureen Tongi, founder and CEO of MTR Agency, a leading art talent agency representing some of the most forward-thinking artists in the world, including, as you may remember from season one, episode 10, Walter and Zonia. In 2018, Maureen was awarded Forbes 30 Under 30 Europe, and in 2019, Art and Culture UK Entrepreneur of the Year at the NatWest Awards. She is a writer and keynote speaker on contemporary art and art investments and has done two TEDx talks. In my former life as a magazine editor, I actually met Maureen not long before she set up MT Art, so I've watched as she's grown this company from her living room floor to a £35 million business that collaborates with huge global organisations and cities across the world. I think there's a lot of good info in this episode for anyone starting their own company or brand. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you so much for having me. We're talking in the afternoon, but I normally ask, do you have any sort of morning routine? Um, I have, I think, yes, I think I love listening to the tiptoe of my firstborn coming to the bed, as I'm sure as all parents will identify, you can hear them from the from the floor upstairs and they're slowly coming to the bed and crippling in. I think it's one of my favourite thing ever. I'm also... Um, very much into Pilates and dance. So I actually luckily started today, which is not every day, with Pilates. Um, So that's usually my happiest time because you have, um, you know, you've exercised, you're very calm, you're very happy about life. Uh, So that's my heaven routine. Makes such a difference, but we don't don't always manage to do it, right? Exactly, exactly. It's a few times um, a week. If my son goes to school, 
because it's half term, then I would be on the bicycle. And I think the effect would be similar. All the pilates would be slightly better. But it'd be similar of just starting the day um, exercising, but also enjoying like and breathing properly. Do you feel like you put much of a divide between work and personal life? running your own company how soon do you look at your emails or check any of that in the morning things like that so there hasn't been a divide ever but I think in a sense it's also was enable me to have a I'm so sorry hang on now I forgot one last explanation as you say divide mm-hmm. um, I think that's a testament to the no divi- division I feel that the truth is that there's never been any divide it's always been fully integrated but that full integration means that like after our chat, I will go and watch my son playing football uh, in Hyde Park, just not far from our office, and then come back again uh, for a key meeting at the office. So in a sense, what has been the full integration has also enabled me to have time for my personal life. Um, so I think it's it's always rethinking what is that division, because, you know, some people could work until 10 p.m. or midnight from Monday to Friday and just have that weekend. Instead, I don't have that. So I get to see my son in out throughout the whole day. But yes, I am always on and I don't, um, and I wouldn't, you know, have a full weekend off either. So I think it's, um, it's putting it into perspective that I feel I get to enjoy a lot of my personal life through this. Mm, that's a really interesting um, way of looking at it. So you never have, re- you never have weekends or sort of mornings off, but it's always integrated in. To your week. Yeah, I think in a sense that like I would never, I'm like, um, I love consistency. So I love working at the same thing every day um, and that kind of brain. So, you know, I, I, I don't like the idea of leaving something to the next day. I don't, I like to just constantly doing something. Um, but it does mean that, you know, working weekend is not me at the office right until 6 p.m., you know, on a Saturday but it means that, of course, if a client is asking me a question, investor questions, or, or you know, an artist is in town, then I will, of course, um, attend to it. Um, equally, I would also just do lovely things with my friends and then just spend time with my family. So it, that's what I mean by that continuity where you just address things as they come. So, you know, if your friends are in town or if a key investor or anyone is in town, you just your diary just goes around that. Um so I think that there's less division between weekdays, weekends, holidays or not. Um, but there is an integration of your personal life as part of it. Mm. So it's that real flexibility that founders yeah. often struggle to to find in their lives. Yeah, well, I think for me, I find it empowering. Uh, but again, to highlight that I am lucky to walk a few minutes. Like my house is a few minutes from my office. I have less commuting than most people would have. Um, I guess for me, it has been more empowering than demotivating um, to feel that I had a real sense of control over my diary as well. Mm. So talk to me about your your work, Maureen. Explain a little bit what MTR Agency does. So as you know, because you were there in one of our very first gathering a good eight years ago which doesn't make us feel very young does it um but we have been in the art world for 15 years um I was always fascinated and wanted to be adding value to artists I think that was really the reason why I was in the sector um I was super lucky to be running the gallery the outsiders London my first was was Tim Lazaridis it was an eye-opener on many different levels one because you know, he came from the council estate and w- had been able to build um, a business in the art world, which is something that's quite rare. Um, he also liked to empower artists, not just through the exhibition of the, the works, but had taken over the old Vic and done loads of public art projects. So he was thinking about it quite differently. Um, and that was deeply inspiring. I was then um, approached as I was running his gallery by an investor that was based in Los Angeles called Steph Sabag who suggested that he would invest in me building up a gallery for him. So we'll be 50-50 partners. So I left London to Los Angeles to do this. Um, and I was still relatively young. It was 23, 24 as I was doing that build up. Um, and it kind of appeared to me very clearly that as Los Angeles is very known for his top talent agencies, the fact that you know they can build reputation, they can build credibility, they can build fame, 
Um, and, and they do so through this enormous monsters that are UTA, CA, and William Morris, which are the top three talent agencies in the world. Um, and I wanted to be that for my talents. I just, it's, it's, um, it's on city, but it's just a joy. And we only, you know, we're still a medium sized company. I can't wait to be a much bigger one, but the joy to be able to realize everything that they want or obtain deals that are really, um, you know, very special for them. I think it's, that's, I think what drives me and the talent agency model could do it better than the Gary model because you could build different divisions, not just selling networks, but um, enabling projects, enabling public art projects, collaborations, digital. And all of this was of interest. So at 25, I thought I have nothing to lose. I might as well do it. Um, and if it fails, it fails. But at least I would have felt proud to just go for something that I really believed in. Um, and, and yeah, really grateful it worked out. Um, it's the most um, self-fulfilling um, uh, business because you just believe in those people, they're talented and you're enabling them to be uh, inspiring large audiences and doing what they love. Um, I would say the saddest moment of my business is when we can't get something for someone we really believe in. So that contracts, obviously the joy is that there are times you're so believing in someone, but you just don't succeed to kind of deliver as much as you would like. I would say that is where you feel the most crap um, in the job. Um, but it's also like, I've always said, like it's a job where you get to be working with the optimist, the one that think that they can do, they can dream, they can be ambitious. So like it's, um, I think it's such a great quality of life um, to be with people who can't see things they can do. Um, and and they can reimagine in reality as well. So it's a sort of it's that for that. It's um it's um it's amazing. And actually that pairs itself really nicely to being a parent and being with children because you just get to also imagine with them. So there's there's definitely a parallel between um dreaming up for your child and shaping up a childhood with creativity and ultimately being able to realize the dreams of the talents that you believe in. Do you feel like parenting has made you more creative? Um, I feel it's more like it has enabled me to uh, show more creativity more than actually being that in the sense that like I was the au pair who loved all the carousels, the activities and things. And as you know, in the art world, it's um, there's not much space for it because you're leading a business, first of all, you're at the top of the leadership, but also it's still a world of high-end um, luxury and creativity and perceptions. I think we've changed that in terms of the public art projects that we're doing, but the, the main perception is still that. Um, I think secretly I'm the one that just loves going on all those carousels and just I could just rock up to a carousel on my own without a child, right? So it just, it's, um, he probably has given me many excuses to just redo all these things that I actually secretly really likes doing. Mm. So the pub, talk to us about some of the public art installations that you've done in recent years and why why you think they're so important. I guess yeah. what you think they do to the societal psyche and how they help people. So as we speak, half the population is live in urban areas. So actually our like main mode of living is now for one person out of two will be to be in a city or a small size city. Um, so what we get to experience in that urban area is really important because ultimately that shapes how we feel, uh, how we address our environment, how we interact with other people as well. Um, in that, public art has a very key role um, to play because, you know, if you think about it, if you get up in the morning and all you see is adverts screaming at you to telling you how to be or what to consume, it's exhausting, right? It's like, it's a it's a visual pollution of its own because it's just really draining. Um, not counting the fact that you can be overwhelmed with loads of people around you and 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 the stress of getting to work on time. Um, so I think for me, public art um, is essential in that conversation. One because it's important to consume visuals that are not dictating how you should consume and how you should be and how you should feel. Um, and instead, there are visuals that open up conversations, hopefully open up your empathy, um, open up your ways of thinking as well. I think that's really healthy. 
Um, the second thing is, it's the same as the speed, right? Like a lot of ads or digital messaging is aimed to be consumed through almost like a shock factor and it triggers you. It's quite anxious driven, right? Um, as you know yourself, like public arts is something that you can consume on a slower pace and just even slowing that pace of how you can digest that content. I think it's really important in 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 being overwhelmed by content that's quite aggressive and quite anxious driven um on on your commute to work on on the on being surrounded by visuals when where you live so that's where we inside that conversation something that i'm extra passionate is that 97 percent of uh, the current public art that you see is by male artists um diversity for us is key to make sure that like if you think of public art as a visual narrative that all of it gets to be inspired by, it's really important that it's diverse. Um, and diverse doesn't mean gender, it means all types of social economics and different backgrounds. Um, and that's something that we've proven over time. And, and you know, I'm super proud that we've been able to inject conversations in central London and in the center of the cities that were complex uh, artistic conversations. Um, and, and hopefully, again, kind of creates new type of conversations that the public is used to see. Um, so that's all the things that I'm really interested in. It's, um, as you know, an enormous passion of mine. On the more childlike nature, it's really, you know, the the texts that we get or the Instagram PMs that we get with people saying, I was waiting for my bus and then this really touched me. And, you know, I just... I really related to this artist because kind of, it just it's it's uh, it's gold. I think it's a golden nugget in a sense. Like um, those are the messages that make you the happiest as a founder because you just think of that person that ultimately you may never have encountered. Um, they are lucky to walk into a gallery, um, and that really I think makes a difference um, because it just hopefully broadens who gets to see. Um, art and, and the artists of you know of the contemporary art scenes. I think that's um that's really exciting as well and very meaningful. What do you think is the future of art? I mean, as you know, that's a very broad uh, <laughs> question because you ask it. Um, I would just say more what I hope for and what we're working towards more than uh, what it is, because as you know, the future is very difficult to predict. Um, what I would hope for is really that, is that suddenly we are, art is a language that would, I hope, um, be spoken by many more people than it is currently. And, and right now it's spoken just by a few. Um, and as, as a visual language, which should be something that, unless you're blind, is one of the language you can speak really easily without background is something that most people don't feel they can enter, interact with or speak with. So we've seen through social media, through public art, through collaborations, like thinking of a Uniqlo meets Tate, all those things that like, there's a real broadening of the sector, I guess opening itself up, but therefore, yeah, just thinking that the visual language will become something actually more universal. It is universal in the sense that right now, every person from every culture can speak it, but it's sadly still reduced to a tiny demographic of people um, who get to really interact with it. So um, that is my hope, is that the sector keeps broadening up, the agencies keep being enlarged. And by this, it means that who gets to shape the visual narratives and the art that we get to see in museums, ultimately, it's also much broader. Um, which should mean that the the artistic conversation we get exposed to are also more interesting, I think. So making it more democratic, more yes. for everyone. I think certainly um, here in the UK, I don't know what it's like in the school system in France, but here in the UK, many of the state schools, it's kind of um, arts, or, first of all, aren't placed as highly as, as many other subjects, such as science and literacy and maths but also um, you're either artistic or you're not you can either do the art that's dictated in school or you're not artistic at all and I hope the conversation around that is shifting as well so that children's creativity is being supported generally as opposed to in a very sort of limited limiting way in which you know if you're not a good painter or you know not what they think is a good painter um, it doesn't mean you're not a it doesn't mean you're not an artist. 
Yeah, totally. And there's a great book on this I would recommend called Visual Thinking that is with Penguin um, on the fact that, you know, we are made 50-50 of verbal and visual thinkers. Um, and school and academia has put a lot of weight on verbal thinkers over visual thinkers. Silly things like um, a visual thinker finds it harder to narrate a story from the beginning to the end, like just, you know, with a beginning, a middle, an end, and a very chronological order of, of the way you narrate that story. A visual thinker is much more likely to jump and highlight certain parts and be much more circular in the way it's narrating the story. There's loads of many differences, and all of us will be on a spectrum of that. And I think the fact that therefore we demean an entire part um, of that learning system is really problematic because we're constantly not encouraging what should be half of the population capacity to really strive in that world. Um, so I think, you know, I think France has a better access to the arts as in, you know, you, you're more encouraged at early stage to go to the theater, to look it up, but realistically it's a very strong intellectual culture. And by being strong academic and intellectual culture, it's a strong verbal culture um, where words and books are kings. Uh, which is fantastic, obviously, on one end, but it's, it creates the opposite problem that we still have, which is if you're a kid that is not academic in France, sadly, you cannot strive. Um, the system is even more um, structured than the English system, and therefore you will have to still be, all the meritocracy is encouraged, meritocracy is poorly understood in that context, because it's meritocracy of a type of brains, uh, and if you're lucky to be that brain, fantastic. But if you're not, uh, you're going to fall through the system. So I feel it's um, every country has its battle towards education. Um, but I wouldn't put France higher than England in terms of education. I would just say that they are looking at it slightly differently. Have you always had an interest in art? Has it always been something that's been really important to you personally? I think creativity before art was essential in the sense that... Um, I mean, just the the need for imagination. I, like, I had a big imagination, and it's um, you know, I read which is a French book recently, a book called um, The Origins, um, and it was really interesting. Is someone that was putting the theory that a lot of people who go from one social class to another is imagination is a big component that they bear in common, um, because I think it's you almost need to imagine a new reality. You almost need to have a coping mechanism and, and to kind of have a toolkit in place. And I think that imagination for me was very vivid. Um, the need for creativity was also very vivid. Um, and therefore, you know, what I found um, really special is we've built a really powerful team of creatives supporting the artists. And again, I divide the two because creatives um, is us being able to say, the square um, of Piccadilly Circus needs X um, and we need to integrate the art. And that's where I see it differently is that constant ability to imagine and integrate how the artist could be relevant and meaningful in this context. And I think that's something that I developed really early on. Um, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed connecting the dots creatively. I enjoyed creating opportunities quite literally and imagining how um, an artist's vision would insert themselves into a place or into a context. Um, so I think that's something that I had strongly. And therefore, through this, it, I think it led me to admire people who were talented. Um, and through that, again, it helped me understanding which value I could add to them, um, which was that creativity. What's your favourite kind of art? Um I mean, at this stage, you know, I'm so deep in that I would be able to enjoy pretty much all of it. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I think you get to get too deep in. Um, I think the the first one that I ever got to enjoy was romanticism because it was politically charged, socially committed, but also uh, very moving in terms of emotions. So it kind of had the emotional, political lens um, and social commitment, which I really like. And we share the we share these friends in common, but Walter and Zaniel and I kind of worked around the idea of formationism. So how technically you would align conceptually to the same idea. So I've always liked things that could express themselves emotionally, politically, socially, technically, and almost feel like the idea is a line across the board. 
Um, so I think that's what I'm most driven to in, um, in personally. But I think at this stage, because you get, you know, you get so, um, you, you get so exposed to so many things and that's the beauty of the job that frankly, I could enjoy, you know, highly conceptual art, uh, performances, like a very technological installation. So innovation through the sector. Now it becomes just a constant thirst and enjoyment of learning what's happening in the sector and meeting artists. So it doesn't mean you put it on your wall. It doesn't mean that you would even relate to it taste wise, but it means that like you're interested in it. And I think there's a constant joy in acquiring that new knowledge um, and the new practices and, and what generation does what, what country does what. So I think that's more the, yeah, the joy of learning about who does what in the sector. We've talked about, about your work and your vision for MTR about making art more democratic and diverse and creating more interesting and engaging public art around the whole world, I guess. Um, what else is a priority to you, Maureen? Um, I feel like, you know, I'm very vocal about the inequalities of the sector there um, and the sector being the art world. Um, I'm definitely that kid who doesn't really like unfairness and don't respond very well to it. And it does avoid my tummy uh, when there's a lot of unfairness. Um, so I think, you know, there's a great book again on that topic called Culture is Bad for You that highlights how ridiculously almost impossible it is for anyone to get into our sector and work in it and strive in it. Um, that's something that um, I've reflected a lot upon. That's the reason why we've never had any unpaid interns, why we've always contributed to the cost, the studio cost of the artists and and why we also incredibly economically driven. We were the first big hope in the art world because we just, we want to make sure artists are economically supported. We understand that like ultimately not speaking about money might mean that those who do not have any financial support uh, will not make it through the sector equally the same for professionals and our professionals. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, it goes again with like broadening the audiences and it, it comes on to diversity and how can our sector be more diverse. I think on the one hand, there's something unfair about it. On the other hand, I think very selfishly, the more diversity, the better the ideas, the better the sector, the more exciting um, the talents will be because diversity produces all of this. Um, so I think it's also just, I think our sector will perform and produce even better ideas and and talents if, if we enable more people to get in. Um, so that's the two, I, I guess that that will be also what occupies lots of my thinking. Have there been any times in your life where your priorities have just shifted completely? Yeah, we, um, like I said, when, so like that beautiful balance I mentioned about Atlas playing football at, at 4 p.m. after you is brand new because when it comes to, I would say it's like, um, just before his birth is when that kind of balance started happening. And it, it was completely done on purpose. Um, I wanted to have sacrificed a lot so that I could have that balance as a parent later. Um, but it did mean that the early years of the company, you know, realistically, that is really when you work Monday to Sunday until midnight with absolutely no break. And you don't even get much reward because at that point, you don't even get people to give you any form of compliments. So you might not even get sales or projects or deals for a few months through that period. So it's a very ungrateful moment, I think is the answer, um, where we're not even discussing compromises, we're talking sacrifices. There are sacrifices in terms of your time, your resources, um, how much you can give, um, and just even your actual well-being and everything that will go with it, like you're just not the priority. Um, I'm super happy I've done it. Um, I would never recommend it unless someone is very passionate to, and want to do it and want to build something, but I don't think it's necessary in life to go through that phase ever. Um, it's, um, but it, it did mean that having done that, um, yes, I can provide a balance. For me, like being a parent was essential. It's just it's something I had always dreamed of. And I didn't want to compromise on. Um, so it meant that I had to be hardcore on that first period of the company for the company to be solid enough to accommodate then 
uh, me to have uh, the balance I wanted. Um, so I, I, I guess it was, it was like signing a contract with yourself. I knew exactly what I was signing. Um, doesn't mean it was very pleasurable um, is the answer. But uh, but very grateful that for my mid-20s did it um, so that my early 30s are much nicer. Mm. Are you good at saying no now to things, at prioritising? Yeah, you do. Like, but I think also there's different types of no's where ultimately, like, the, um, you know, you'll be in a place where initially you have to say no to everything uh, for the for your company's sake. Your company is always priority. So also you can't afford going to a dinner you, or restaurants or anything because you don't have the means to do anything. So you can't say no. Um, and for the benefit of your company, I think the the reason why you say no changes. Um, so like you you now say no because you know you think uh, a colleague could be more supportive on a point and jump on that file or do that client meeting and you don't have to do it so that you can spend time with your family, right? So your no's change it. I've had to practice no very early on in my life because. A lot of the decisions I was making were very full-on decisions. So my practice of the no was very there. Like you just have to say no. Um, but the reason of my no's is very different. Like, you know, now I, I decline a meeting to make sure that I go to my Pilates and you can prioritize yourself better ultimately. Um, but I've I've been used to saying no for a long time, I would say, for just different reasons now. And do you think it comes easily to you now? Yeah, it just, the thing is, is, it's every stage, as you know yourself, like every company stage or is, is very similar to every stage of your life where you need different toolkits. Um, if I collapse as a resource right now, it means it impacts drastically a full team, a global business, artists, and the family, right? So I, it's not an option. Like it's too risky to, um, to collapse as a resource because the, the, the consequences are much more dramatic than they were when I was starting. Um, so I feel it's also like, it's also the benefit of MTR that I look after myself realistically. It's in the benefit of the artist that I'm in a good position uh, mentally and physically. Um, so it, it's, it's a management of risk and I think it's a management of resources um, without sounding too business led in terms of vocabulary. I think it's, it just you realize that as you know yourself that like you need to be there for others and the best way to be there for others is to be solid yourself so it's um it's a it's a conscious that you can much less object with it in the same way that when you are a very young funder you know you don't ever see loads of people who have loads of your employees will have families and consequences like this but i do now so i need to make sure that like I'm inspiring, I turn up with the right tone of voice, I empower them, I give them confidence and I support them. Um, and all of those things needs to come from me. And as you know, they need to come from the strengths that I need to nurture. Um, and if I don't nurture that, then I can't give that much. And then that's, that's, the, that's the way things can unfold uh, negatively, I think. I imagine that might be quite a useful analogy that you've given for people to use when they struggle to prioritize themselves, that maybe thinking of themselves as, you know, really a business and what are the, what are the resources that need to be um, kept working well so that the rest of the business can function um, might be quite a nice way for a lot of people to connect with that if they're struggling. Yeah, totally. Well, you are always a single resource and there's only so much you can do in one day. And it's it's why... You know, if your body needs to sleep, then your body needs to sleep. If you're, it's it's as basic as this. Biology, sadly, you, there's only so much corners you can cut, but it does catches you back pretty quickly. Um, and we all know that mood swings, anxiety, all those things can happen really quickly by not looking after yourself, and that does impact us. Um, so even if you're struggling, which clearly is my case, to say must do it for myself, then I think it's easier to say must do it for other people because it will definitely have an impact and and especially having children they pick up on it in two seconds they know you're anxious they know you're unwell um all those things get passed on there's so it's it's um it feels better to know that you're not passing on uh, as much negativity and of course if there are days you feel crap then you feel crap like there's it's not to say 
you must always wake up like meditating pilates and being absolutely positive at all times um it's just to say that like if you can look after yourself and most days try to be like this and definitely uh, pull the resources to be that mm. what's something that's not a priority to you maureen um it, it, like literally what the definition or expectations that other people are on you I think in a sense I had to get rid of it the perception of others I had to get rid of it very quickly because we were setting up a disruptor you know we forget that we were the first high agency in the art world which meant that realistically we were not going to be loved at all corners doing something differently um this substantially meant that I had to get rid of um you know how I felt towards people thinking poorly of me or thinking negatively of me. I would say very hard when it comes to motherhood because then you're just already at stage two when you've already gone through stage one. So that's easy at that point. Um, but it means that therefore it's, I just cannot afford to care about it. The, the reason is because I've chosen a career that will not make me liked by everyone. Um, so if I decide that this is important, this would actually be the end because it's not possible with the risk we're going to take and what we are trying to do uh, in changing things. Um, so getting rid of it is something that is one quite liberating because I think we're always so scared about what if people don't like us, what is this, what is that? I think what if someone humiliates us publicly? I think doesn't mean I love it, doesn't mean that I, you know, if someone does it, I'm like, this is exciting, but it does mean I'm able to continue forward uh, if this is happening. Um, and like I mentioned, on the motherhood side, it also helps because I'm not, um, I will make decisions that people will criticize, such as not taking a full maternity leave or uh, acting in a certain way. And so I think this has enabled me to continue to make the decisions that I believe to be right for us values-wise. And as parents too, was not worrying about what others could be saying about them. And I'm sure for some people, it's they don't agree with the way we've gone about things. Are there any tools or thought processes you can share that help you get to that place? Um, yeah, definitely plenty. Um, that was actually a topic of our um, of our launch, actually. Um, the tips and tools wise um i mean first anything you can do that gives perspective um it sounds silly but the big picture is always the one that can help you so this could be reading um just acknowledging the fact that many many people go through what you're going through um so books wise that's always really handy because you just realize you're part of a system that's much bigger with ultimately people going through what you're going through as well um I think, you know, I, I, clearly that came up a lot today, but then so Pilates helps because that's also the breathing where you just learn to breathe well. But I think through breathing, you also learn to reflect calmly. Um, and anxiety is the one that triggers all this little thoughts. It's that kind of fast, rapid, as you know, thinking that you are crap, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, the calmer you are, usually the better your thinking process. And so however you reach your calm state, like it could be running for some, walking for some others, uh, speaking for two hours, not next to your phone with a friend in a deep, long conversation, but anything that will bring a calm state to the mind, first of all, would usually enable you to understand what's best for you because you're less triggered um, about it. Um, and then just constantly informing yourself on how prejudice are built and how our conceptions of life are built you know there's a reason why we feel pressured to be x and then it's for you once you understand why that pressure was built to decide whether you want to keep that pressure or actually you want to let it go but you might want to let it go is the answer like so i think trying to constantly think the you know conceptions that we're being given have been made by someone at some point whether it's a society a government whoever has made it um you can choose to keep them, you can choose to ditch them. Um, so try and go to the source. Um, I don't know, like, let's just say on the motherhood side, um, you know, a mother must be breastfeeding for six months is something that we could read, you know, somewhere on an article. Let's just try and comprehend why the UK says this and France doesn't say this or Denmark says something different. That shows that, like, 
your costs are given such different truths. Um, let's try to get to the bottom of why that is said that way. And then just make up what you think is right for you. Um, so knowledge is always power, which is why I think books are always power in that context. And understanding that all of those are just conceptions. Um, of course, if it's something medically that is bad or when you've been like this, then that's a doctor. But everything else is are ultimately ones that you should be reading about and really trying to figure out what is the right thing for me after having listened to the expert advice and read extensively. Um, just to constantly feel that you're making your own decisions and that you are being empowered. We constantly being influenced. I'm not saying I'm making most of my own decisions, but at least I feel empowered by the decisions I've made uh, because I can explain why I made them, if that makes sense. Mm. And I think it's really key what you said earlier as well about just being okay with people disagreeing with you or thinking you're wrong or not liking you for it, as opposed to believing that you need to prove them wrong. Hey, if you're enjoying the themes in this podcast and want to delve a bit deeper into prioritizing your own life, come on over to my Substack, Prioritize This, where I release weekly essays, voice memos, and coaching questions on priorities, habits, values, and generally the stuff that makes for a better life. Search Prioritize This on the Substack website or app. Yeah, definitely. Waste a lot of our emotion on trying to prove to other people that we're right as opposed to just going about with whatever we need to do. Yeah, and I actually think that's something that divides me from the French system on that note. Um, I um, I was recently interviewed on a French TV show and I was not given a seat um, to to be not comfortable and I was put a lot on edge. And it reminded me of my studies in France where you're told um, in my first degree, you're told that you're crap so that you can build up the anger that you prove them wrong. And I, I just was, I was kind of debating this with my husband this weekend saying, yes, it's great because there's a level of resilience I can build up from that, but I don't believe in anger and being long-term resilience. Like ultimately anger can only lead in something negative very long-term. I'm sure short-term you can be like, oh, I get it. I will go and prove them wrong because I'm worse it. Um, but like that doesn't fulfill anything in a longer term perspective, um, which is why I much more believe in making people feel comfortable in being collaborative and, and teaching them to ask the right questions and to source the right knowledge more than being put on edge in that way. Um, but it's that is where the, I see a difference between two cultures as well. Um, and and I, I don't stand in... I don't think it's right to just build people up um, on an anger level so that they just want to show you desperately that they were something. I think that is, I, I don't see that how that could lead very positively in the longer term. In the short term, maybe there's a few achievements that could be driven from that. But in the longer term, you can't build much on that. Mm. I feel like that's really a good, good advice for anyone. What's an area of your life or something that, or someone that you'd like to prioritize more? Um, that's something we touch upon when I last saw you is um, I was the lucky person experiencing um, a cyberbullying crisis in October, November. So I had to handle something that sadly is very common to female founders, but loads of trolls coming at my company and artists and, and myself personally. Um, What's really interesting is during any crisis, you're having to step up. It's either you crash or you step up um, personally and professionally. It's, in fact, what everyone tells you when this happens. They, they always tell you, one, it will pass quickly. So and you're going to be so much more resilient at the back of it. And, of course, at that point, you definitely don't want to hear that, but it's sadly the truth. Um, and so outside of all the tips and learning curves that I went through with that and I would say as a team, we're substantially more resilient um, on the back of it. I think something I realized is how important my own creativity was um, outside of my business, outside of even parenting, how I was, that could pull me out, that could pull me in a much happier state. Um, And so I was pregnant throughout all of this. And, you know, you will see, you will see over the coming days, weeks where, I worked on a very short film with absolutely no objectives. There's no commercial objectives. There's nothing. It's just the joy of having a pure artistic content around the vulnerability of pregnancy and actually the tension between 
how vulnerable you are, but also how strong you are, the anxiety side, but also the calm that it will emane from it. And all of this in a very artistic format. Um, and I loved it. And I did many things like this um, and, and pushed my creativity much further and also pushed my comfort zone in that creativity. And I, it, um, it felt amazing. And that's something that I really want to keep now that I'm no more in the crisis stage for the past few months is, um, is replacing that creativity at the heart because I realized I'm doing things that obviously no objective is something I was missing. Um, and of course, running a business, there's always objectives. That's, that's almost a definition of it. Um, but I feel like recovering that sense for myself was really empowering. Um, because I had to, I was faced with a lot of, uh, discrimination and in the macro context that had nothing to do with me is that female leaders are sadly silenced and dealt with in a certain way. I also had to intellectualize what I was going through. And I think it also re committed me to my love for philosophy, my love for needing to know the macro picture and understand that. So I would say yeah, on the back of it as well, I'm even more of a reader than I was before. Um, and and I now I don't apologize. Like I remember when we did that short film, I booked a whole Thursday off to do that short film. That would have that would have made, made me feel so guilty. I think a year ago, but this now feels like this is very essential. Like I just I want a, a place, a room, almost a safe space for um, my own creative expression. Um, and and I've ironically because that's what everyone tells you. I've stepped up as a CEO massively. In fact, I've, the company has never done so well since all of this is in place. So it's always a classic where it goes back to putting yourself as a priority, but the happier you get, obviously, the more you can give back. Um, and despite taking a bit more time off, it meant my company is actually in a much better place because creatively I read more, I interact more, I connect more, um, and I'm sure this influences us within the company to do the same. So... It's, um, you know, it goes back to rediscovering yourself. And I think that's something that being more creative, actually setting off really days where this is just creativity um, is something that I've really enjoyed and I hope to keep from that. That's wonderful. It's really that kind of whole brain thinking, right? That idea that if we're always doing our work in a certain way or thinking in a certain way, then we're not using the bits of our brain that's, that need using and supporting whereby if you just are able um, and fortunate enough to have your days organized so that you can take a day off in order to work on that more creative side that that can and has clearly you know supported the rest of your work so extensively yeah totally and I think society always says this is silly like you know I'm sure you've heard it and you've been there where we always diminish some things that are creative because it sounds like a little silly hobby that we're doing on the side or even something maybe a bit vain. So I think it's just re-giving the nobility to that creativity that it deserves Um, because I've always heard it. You always hear it when you're younger that this was a bit superficial, but actually it's realising that it's not superficial if you are someone creative. It's actually something that fuels you um, and to give it the space that it deserves. And can make such a difference to mental health as well. Yeah, massive. I mean, what we've what we've gone through, we just got told by our lawyers this um, at lunchtime, we were the most dignified, elegant clients apparently. Because <laughs> just, I think it's just, yeah, I think it's a good tribute to us on our coping mechanism. But yes, I do think getting up every morning and still seeing things creatively means also probably to the things still seeing things positively i mean zonia again who we share in common is my total hero for this because she's able to strive through so much challenges and still being creative so i'm sure i was inspired by my artists on that level and i didn't even face half of what they faced um but yes creativity is a very powerful tool brilliant thank you so much for talking to me maureen it's been really interesting and um, good luck in this next stage. You're due in how many days? Four days. Four days. <laughs> well, I hope you um, you get some rest and some opportunities to step back and sort of lean into that creativity and then come back whenever you're ready and it feels right for you. Well, thank you for having me today. Take care. 
If you enjoyed this episode of Priorities, I'd really appreciate it if you could make it your priority today to hit subscribe and also rate and review as this helps other people find it. Thank you so much for listening.